Fair enough. Hello, everybody. I hope everybody's having an awesome Thursday. It is Thursday. It's uh, we are in autumn now, right? It's Thursday. Yeah. Is, uh, oh, it is autumn. Yesterday, do you remember? Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, twenty first day of September. Yeah. Exactly. See, we got to do that song again. Go ahead, Marnie. Come on, you got to do it. You remember. <laughs> the 20 where you were the night of the 21st of september that's as far like i i'm good yep. for about three notes um between middle c and the d above middle c so <laughs> and i'm i'm not good for any notes you don't want to hear me sing uh it would be an absolute disaster so <laughs> that's why i stopped i knew how to not get all of these people <laughs> yeah. jump off the call <laughs> so yeah things not to do on a webinar there you go there you go <laughs> Well, welcome everybody. Um, we are here today for some very exciting information about running a risk assessment for your clients. Only um, in the IT space can you start a webinar to with. We're going to have an exciting webinar about risk assessment. <laughs> You're setting the bar high. Uh, exactly. <laughs> it is not just a webinar; it's an exciting webinar, <laughs> and we promise not to put you asleep. Um, but yes, we are here today. We're going to talk about uh, doing a risk assessment before an insurance company runs over your business. And uh, we have uh, two very special guests here with us. We have Marnie Stockman, who is the CEO of Lifecycle Insights. Welcome, Marnie. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you for being here and thank you for singing. That was a little extra bonus. Sure. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know if it's a bonus, but it was a little extra. <laughs> we have uh, Larry Medor. And, and Larry, I say Medor. Is it Medor or is it Medor? No, it's really easy. It's like I'm Medor at the bar. There you Medor. go. You know, you go. I'm so, Medor, Medor at church, Medor, Medor somewhere. There we go. So that's the perfect way for now me to- Now we know. With a man whose last name is Tomaszewski, we're going to get Medor right. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> And uh, Larry is the channel chief for Data Stream Cyber Insurance. Thank you yep. for being here, Larry. Thank you for inviting me. Appreciate it. So I gave, you know, just your names, your titles. Uh, I'd like to learn a little bit more about you guys. Our audience would like to learn. So Marty, could you uh, give us a little background about yourself? Yeah, 100%. So I started out as a high school math teacher, and now I'm the CEO of Lifecycle Insights, QBR reporting platform. So typical career that? trajectory that a lot of folks take, uh, yeah. <laughs> for sure. Um, but a bit about that, because that's not the normal path. First, I say as a high school math teacher, um, you can bet I'm either good at customer success or, scale, or sales because I pitched pre-calculus to 16-year-olds. So oh. that takes some skill in that world. Um, that landed me in the ed tech space, uh, doing customer success for the largest ed tech company in the world. And um, you learn a lot of things about one, how to drive raving fans and second, how to deliver a good business review and a bad business review. So I've seen many a bad one and I've definitely learned how to, how to move them from feeling like um, you're catching knives <laughs> in your back <laughs> Um, to being strategic. So the developers and I were out looking for a place to kind of to, to start our own company with some of the lessons that we had learned. And I was playing volleyball. So actually it was, I, I met him in a bar, not met her in a bar. Um, <laughs> after a volleyball match, Alex Farling, who was an MSP and I met and uh, we'd played volleyball for years together. And I said, hey, we're looking at solving a problem. Are there any data related types of problems in the managed service space. And he said, uh, yeah, I spent eight hours together today cobbling together, which I didn't realize was an industry term, right? Mm -hmm. Cobbling together my business review from, and then he threw all of these acronyms at me, PSAs, RMMs, IT documentation platforms, right? For VARs and ISPs and MSPs, <laughs> like that is, that is a lot of letters. Yeah. Um, but is that a problem we could solve? So that is how we came to be Lifecycle Insights. We were aiming to solve the problem of long to prep non-strategic business reviews for MSP. So now I can use all of those letters in a sentence um, <laughs> that typically makes sense. And, um, and my background in the ed tech world, the platform I worked on is an assessment platform. So I do have a ton of experience in data analytics around assessment and how to use assessment to drive conversations and strategy. So I guess that is the reason why you would come listen to a math teacher talk about a cybersecurity <laughs> risk assessment in a conversation. How's that? 
That's awesome. And you wrote a book on customer service, right? I, I wrote, I've written two books. Uh, they're right here. So we've got, I wrote the book on customer success for MSPs, exactly. literally, because I like a good pun. I love and it. then um, Juan Fernandez and I just published um, the MSP Owner's Handbook QBR edition. So okay. yeah. That's awesome. So there's a couple books for your reading pleasure. Uh, you can take a look at those on Amazon this weekend and uh, give you something to do, right? So uh, yeah, it's out raining. So what else are you going to do? They're actually easy reads and they're kind of stories about how to get from where you are to where you want to be along with some kind of worksheet, to be quite honest, both of them have links to activities to really drive thought thinking around your MSP and your process on what you want to do to deliver customer success for your clients. That's awesome. And uh, Larry, um, you, you know, volleyball, you know, uh, baseball, what else you well, got? What else you got? Let's see. You know, I was not a high school math teacher. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm probably going to get schooled here, but I was actually probably the high school math teacher hated student because I was always <laughs> like, I don't need to know trigonometry. I don't need to know this stuff because right. that's not what I'm going into. Um, so, yeah, like I said, I'm probably going to get schooled here, but uh, she's going to start teaching me classes on math and all that fun well, stuff. The interesting piece is if you think about what you just said, it is exactly what MSPs often hear in business reviews if you come at the wrong approach for cybersecurity. Like, I'm not going to be a cybersecurity expert. I don't want to hear about all of your flux capacitors, et cetera, right? You have to give them a reason to want to learn it. So the first five minutes of my pre-calc class would have convinced you why you wanted to stay for the next 70 minutes type of thing. Um, but I think that's an important point of... If you think about it from the perspective of you are educating your clients um, in risk, it is yep. very much you need to approach it as I could be the worst math teacher that my client has ever had. And I could just start throwing out theorems and saying, like, I know you don't care about this, but I'm still going to spit it out for the next 75 minutes. Or you could take the approach of let's talk about your business. Right. So. I was working with 16 year olds and I had to give them a story about why they would care, right? It needed to relate yeah. to their actual lives. Um, and then they would engage in the lesson. As a matter of fact, one of my, the, one of my favorite comments ever, I can still remember the kid, Kurt, who told me this, he said, Ms. Stockman, I don't even want to learn pre-calc, but like every time I come in class, you make me want to be here and want to learn the lesson. So I don't awesome. know what magic you've got. But I think it's the same thing, right? I'm not here to tell math stories, but it's the same yeah. thing that MSPs need to give the compelling why so people yeah. want to engage in the conversation. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's, there's definitely um, a lot of similarities in there trying to avoid business owners from being the deer in the headlights, you know, the eyes glazed over, um, yeah. not understanding what we're talking about, because if we're not having the proper conversations, you know, the business conversations, that are so critical um, for us in, in today's world. Um, well, and think about the class where maybe you felt the least comfortable, right? Were they talking over your head? Were they asking questions you didn't understand? Were they assuming things? So if you go into a business review and start talking, again, flux capacitors and gadgets and gadgets and things that the CEO isn't going to understand, they're not... It, I don't want to be invited back to that party, right? right? And I'm confused. So a confused mind doesn't buy, right? They say yeah. that all the time. Um, so you have to really find ways to make it important to them. Absolutely. And so we'll, we'll be real uh, careful with Larry, not throwing any, uh, you know. Oh, no, man, no but, algorithms on the call yes. today. I promise. I will not drag my whiteboard over and do any math. I could, but I won't. So Larry, besides math, um, you can give us a you know, background <laughs> on yourself. Sir? Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Um, so some of you may recognize me. Some of you may not. I've been in the channel for about 20 years. Primarily, most of that time was spent with CNET uh, in a little B2B division called CNET Content Solutions. I was the senior manager for Channel Online. Um, then I was with GreenLink Net Networks, my good friends there uh, for a little while until I got approached with this fantastic opportunity to uh, join an up and coming company called DataStream Insurance. And we are a cyber insurance broker. That's all we do. That is our swim lane. Um, we've got about 30 different carriers in our portfolio. And just recently, um, they elected to name me the channel chief just because awesome. of my channel experience. So, uh, you know, I'm honored, I'm humbled. 
Uh, I'm very happy to be here and, you know, just kind of, and Marty, I was just going to say, there's really not a whole lot of difference between 16 year olds and, you know, us 40 something MS <laughs> year old MSPs. Um, well, the right, difference I, is if I'm going to assign detention, I have to call your wife <laughs> and your mother. So that's really <laughs> where the conversation. Yeah. And I'm stretching it on 40 year old for me, but um, <laughs> we, we might want to add quite a few years to that, but uh, no, thrilled to be here. And Marty, this one, this one's yours. So I'm just here to help out where I can. Awesome. Well, thank you guys uh, both for being here. Um, again, let's uh, let's kick off this exciting topic. Of, <laughs> yeah. And so we'll, we'll get the party started here. Um, so, Marty, talk to us a little bit more about the this whole aspect of risk assessments prior to beginning um, the whole cyber uh, insurance discovery process. So it's interesting because, um, you know, there's there's the approach to legislation, right, can mandate the ways things will happen in the world of IT. And then there's the reality that insurance is actually pushing IT providers um, faster and further than legislation is because legislation happens so slowly. So as insurance companies are realizing that just quickly adding a little rider for cybersecurity liability insurance policy is not actually the way to make money, right? Because if they get hit with ransomware, they have to pay out a ton. Um, this I, cybersecurity liability insurance is a great way to drive business for MSPs because companies will not get insurance if they can't answer the questions. The trick is to know one, your place when you're not a certified insurance agent, right? So what can you do in the conversation, not get yourself in trouble? And two, how can you use the conversation uh, to help sell? And how can you get ahead of the conversation so you don't have to be blindsided by it? So one of the Lifecycle Insights partners um, also works for a cybersecurity insurance company and aggregated 35 different forms into an assessment. And the beauty of this is we've converted it from the language that all the insurance carriers provide or the insurance um, providers use to basically English that you could use to communicate to your partners. Yeah. I think that's really important. As an educator, I always said I was a really good English to English translator. I could translate math to student English and back again. When I was a customer success manager, I translated school to IT mm -hmm. back to school again. And now I believe as CEO of Lifecycle Insights, I do a good job of translating, right? What the MSP needs to deliver in a business review to value for their client. And I think MSPs are the English to English translator between a business problem, yeah. technology solution. Yeah, especially when you take a look at the whole idea of an assessment. I mean, if you're taking you know, compiling, you know, 35 different type of assessments into one. Um, I mean, that's, there's, there's a lot of information to be able to, to look at, you know, that ag aggregate of that. Um, and it, you know, it's a foreign language, right? Um, there's a lot of questions that um, are very difficult uh, in, in answering, and we have to be, um, you know, we have to have a better understanding of those. Um, now, you know, I'm assuming that you as Lifecycle Insights has a um, a great way to do an assessment, um, making it easier because as we all know, as we're doing assessments and we're doing QBRs, a lot of time, you know, we're, we're grabbing all this data and it takes forever to be able to, you know, compile the reports and pull all this information together. Um, you know, what do you guys have that can make this easier? So we certainly have a library of templates, but for this conversation, I'm going to actually share the one assessment that breaks down some of the cybersecurity insurance questions, because I think for the folks that have joined, it will be interesting to point out a couple of the highlights of where they can really um, drive business in the conversations, especially um, you know, we talk about the English to English translation. I think one of the good ways to have conversations is to be able to tell stories um, and to be able to tell stories aligned with the questions that you're asking, give your end user, right? The, the, the company that you're working with and selling to the compelling why. Um, I'm a big fan of Simon Sinek's book, Start With Why. And basically 
the sum of that whole book, since Dan's already giving you two books to read this weekend, I'll just sum up this book for you. But the summary, the summary of that book is if you, if they believe in your why, they'll buy your what. So what you don't want to do is come in hot with, all right, I've got a BDR and an EDR and some AV and any other three, three letter, two letter acronyms that you can, right? Um, right. I'm sure you want this. No, I'm, I'm confident they don't. In the same way that I didn't come marching into pre-calc that day saying like, all right, get out your pencils. We're going to talk um, Pythagorean theorem today. So <laughs> I think to have the stories to tell of why and how it's impacted other businesses and how it can impact them is a great place to start. So I'm going to pull up um, the the assessment that we have. Uh, if you'll give me screen sharing, I oh, will. Yes. Otherwise, I'll mime it and it'll be a really <laughs> awkward. <laughs> Sing, she mimes, you know. Hey. <laughs> yeah. you know, things I don't actually do. Both of those things. <laughs> And I would definitely um, say that, all right, you've got the chat and Q&A. All right, so let's talk about risk assessment here. So I'm gonna go into our assessments and I wanna pull up, I'm just gonna start um, this cybersecurity risk assessment. And I'm gonna start by collapsing the categories so we can see all of what um, insurance carriers are asking. So again, this is aggregated from 35 different insurance policies. So take a look at how many categories they have. As an MSP, think about one of two things. Uh, first, are you being asked to fill out this assessment? Should you fill out this assessment? <laughs> and two, are your clients filling this out without your help? Like their threats on both sides of that conversation. Larry, I suspect you have an opinion on that of, um, of where you should be in that cycle. Yeah, we, we tell people to be incredibly cautious about what you're doing on these things because all of a sudden, if you answer this wrong, all of a sudden you could be held liable. So if it's pretty linear, yes or no answer, eh, that's a little bit better than anything else, but um, you just gotta be really careful when assisting and doing something like this. So last week on our weekly workshop, we talked about like what not to say when you're discussing cybersecurity, liability insurance. And I think um, one of the most important pieces was be vague when it comes to their actual policy, right? Um, MSPs are not licensed um, cybersecurity carriers. And so to be able to say like, you're not covered for that, or you are covered for that is where that could put you in jeopardy. But to say, you know, I've got other clients who have... Um, you know, X, Y, or Z, like that their insurance carrier had questions around this, you should follow up with yours, right? If there are places where you have concern to encourage them, like, oh, I've seen other folks say they needed additional coverage here or there. You should ask your, you should ask your carrier if, you know, we are covered for X, Y, or Z. So when the biggest takeaway is be vague, that doesn't feel super helpful, but I do feel like it's super important to be able to say it part of protecting yourself is to be sure to use the language the right way. The other piece is to your point, there are places where you absolutely can respond because some of the questions are, do you have this thing or right. do you have it turned on, right? Um, so the first piece, I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna just look at a couple of these categories and talk about, um, kind of lessons learned or stories. And I, I'm sure everyone on the call has stories that they can share in having this conversation. Um, when it comes to data handling, right? There are a few questions here. I mentioned I used to work with school systems. Um, what I found interesting with data handling is that I would have a school system that understood their PII information was important. As a matter of fact, we would have RFP um, you know, presentations, and they would grill us for an hour about our security process, um, our technology, our processes, our procedures, et cetera, internally. We would pass the test, get the account, and I kid you not, the same people would then email me a spreadsheet with student names, addresses, ID numbers, mm -hmm. and social security numbers. And I'm like, I, I'm not sure we're understanding all of these pieces. So I think one of the things that managed service providers can do to educate folks in data handling is first to show some, share some stories 
where data handling gone poorly has caused problems for end users, right? Um, I was I was leaving the ed tech company where I worked when Baltimore County Public Schools had a all call text message to every human that um, that was associated that said, shut down your computer now, right? Do not log into any of the systems. We've been ransomware. And recently, LAUSD, who has 650,000 students, right, had um, had an incident. So I think the data handling questions is really important. But to also talk about it's not just about the systems you use, but let's think about where it is and how we communicate right. it. The yes. next one. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, I, I mean, I think that's critical. I mean, it's um, sorry, my voice. I, I'm is. As you might not all know, I'm uh, just getting over COVID, so I, my voice is kind of going in and out here. Um, but absolutely, I mean, you know, when you take a look at, um, you know, that student data, um, you know, yesterday we talked a little bit about um, out in L.A., um, you know, where some of the student data had uh, been breached and, um, uh, you know, just how that data is handled uh, is just a critical aspect of it. Uh, Larry, is there anything more you want to add to that? <coughs> Uh oh, you're on mute. Sorry, I forgot I've got double mutes here. No, I really don't. I was just going to say in the interest of time, I know Marnie's got a whole lot of stuff she wants to talk about here, and I'll jump in here in a little bit. Perfect. Perfect. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to go through a few of these. Multi-factor authentication is the next one, because I think um, we all know that, that well, I always say MFA starts with MF for a reason, but we got to do it. Right? So like, it's no one's happy about this, right. but it, it must be done. Um, so I think what's interesting here, and Dan, you and I were talking about the whole notion of, um, well, first, it used to be cybersecurity insurance policies just said, do you use MFA? Like, what kind of question is that? Like ever once, like, or 19 times a day or heaven forbid, 19 times a minute, right? Um, so I think what's interesting is in this particular um, assessment, they saw four different ways they were asking MFA questions. So no longer is the question, do you have MFA enabled? They then would say, do you have MFA enabled everywhere? Uh, and then there are some combo platters of, do you have MFA enabled on specific types of um, accounts? What's interesting here is that there are absolutely some places, we talked about this before, um, like for a monitor that is in a storefront as a website, right, that, that is public facing and it's just literally a sales tool, no MFA there. So they ask the question, do you have MFA everywhere? And you're sitting here questioning, how do I respond to that? Because right. I've got a monitor in public. So our understanding is that what's important about that conversation is to just disclose that I've got a monitor that's public facing that we don't have MFA turned on, right? Yeah, um, Larry, that before, that's what you've seen. Yeah, I mean, because there's those, um, I mean, it's it, there's nothing black and black and white, right? I mean, there's going to be some shades of gray in between that, you know, we have to account for, um, you know, so that's where it can be tricky and difficult. And, you know, you just need to make sure you're fully disclosing uh, those details. And, and if I can add, I, I would also say documenting uh, all right. of those details. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, and, the other and, thing that, oh, go ahead, Marnie. Go ahead. No, you go. Um, yeah, you know, the other thing that, um, you know, you and I had talked about yesterday and, you know, we we're seeing out there in, uh, you know, across the states is just the, the you know, continued movement of shadow IT, uh, continuation of, uh, you know, uh, you know, end users that are using different applications, um, different SaaS applications, and whether or not um, MFA is being put in place for that, um, because you don't know you know, if they're using a certain application and, um, you know, you need to have a better understanding of that. So um, we, we actually integrate with two SaaS monitoring tools for exactly that, right? Because MSPs yeah. wanting to be able to, to show their partners, you know, their clients that in fact, even though you've told them not to go at, you know, everybody thinks, oh, I, I just don't want my team to add Minecraft, right? Because they're playing games all right. day. But that's not what they're doing, right? The shadow IT that they're seeing is more along the lines of 
it's typically the sales team, hate to break it to everybody, right? They're seeing the sales team go out and they get a productivity tool because they feel like it will get them there faster, right? So that's, um, I think that's the piece there is that the, nobody's, adding shadow IT to be evil. I say nobody, that's clearly not true. But in general, the intent for shadow IT is not for evil. But if you don't have ways to manage and track that and protect that, um, there are a lot of places where MFA is not natively added. And if you don't have insight into it, that can be a problem. So I think, um, again, MFA, all the, all the cyber folks I talk to say, you got MFA, right? And so uh, while I'm no MFA expert, I do know that everybody tells me, <laughs> right? Like this is, right. this one is, is to not be, to not be messed with. Um, I thought this was really interesting when I looked at this assessment is that there were only two, um, so first I'm going to answer, like, let's chat about the one in the, the chat. Um, some clients and users will refuse MFA. How would you approach this? Sadly, I think the Uber situation right now, right, would be a, a good a good conversation story starter on this. This is where I would really recommend having a story to tell um, that 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 the end user can feel what could potentially happen without MFA and how it protects. If you just say. MFA is important. What's it do? It means you're going to have to pick up your phone every 15 seconds, right? And type in a code. They're right. thinking, I hate those things. I think one, acknowledge the pain, right? It somehow hurts a little less when a doctor says, this is going to sting a little when they give you a shot because you're prepared for it. So don't act like MFA is sunshine right. and roses. It's miserable, but. <laughs> yeah. And I, I like to say, you know, I mean, ultimately, if if it does cause you some grief, that means you're doing it the right way. Um, yeah. If it's a scenario where you're like, oh, I got to grab my phone and do this again. Well, you're doing it the right way. You are you are protecting yourself. And um, but like you said, I mean, if you make it known that this is what you can expect, um, then it is less of a, a thing of them questioning of do I really need to do this? Yeah. And if I can interject real quick, I mean, MFA is one of the top three things that every carrier is now looking for. And yeah. you're really, really hurting your chances at getting approved for insurance without MFA. Um, I'm typing an answer to one of the uh, one of the questions in the chat. So you mentioned that I actually wrote a list because I heard that these these were the top five um things that sort of everyone expects, whether or not you agree that these should be the top five things that they have. MFA was at the top of that list. Um, mm -hmm. EDR, mm -hmm. next gen AV, uh, mm -hmm. immutable backups, and cybersecurity phishing training were the five. Absolutely. Things. Absolutely. I no doubt. Um, so I think I'm going to jump to the employee awareness training piece because I just mentioned five things, right? And I also, in, in the same question, Whoever put in, you know, some folks refuse MFA. I'm sure also some refuse cybersecurity phishing training, but it's one of the top five things that, um, you know, cybersecurity liability and insurance carriers, for the record, I'm ready for an acronym for that because that's a long phrase to <laughs> completely right. just state over and over again. Um, uh, but that's one of the pieces that they are looking for. So, uh, that's another piece that we integrate with because it makes sense in a business review, right? When you're reviewing the business, right? You're talking about business goals and outcomes with your clients, um, that you're identifying risk for them, and that one of the things they need to do to protect themselves is phishing training. So mm -hmm. there are certainly multiple tools on the market. We integrate with uh, several of them and have more on the way to be able to report in the same place. Um I think there are a few things to take note on that. So having come from education, right? I tested a lot of people. I've looked at a lot of data. And one thing I can tell you as a teacher is if you're going to collect the data, you should do something with it. And then you should take action on it. If you're just collecting a bunch of data that sits out in the ether, there are no points for adding rows to Excel spreadsheets, right? right. You only get the points when you take action from it. So when it comes to employee awareness training, it makes sense to have a cadence of when you're going to review this for improvement, not punishment. So I think that's the first step, right? That's the first piece that is key. And the other piece is 
Um, if you were only calling them to say, oh, Larry, wanted to let you know, Dan clicked on a phishing campaign email today, right? Like, oh, Dan did it again. That he's not going to want to pick up the call, right? If I'm only ever calling to tell on Dan. But if we're having a conversation around your risk and say, okay, 80% of your partners, right? Or 80% of your employees have passed their phishing simulations. Let's see, you know, what else we can do to, um, you know, to improve the security posture of your humans, right? And have the whole conversation around the human firewall bit. Um, I think that's powerful and it tells the story um, in a business review when you're talking about their business and protecting it. Absolutely. And, and we uh, we have a couple of people that asked if you could repeat those top five. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so MFA, <laughs> we know that one. Um, EDR and um, next gen AV, immutable backups and cybersecurity phishing training. Yep. Perfect. Spot on. One other thing that um, I, you know, I wanted to bring up is, you know, when we talk about, um, you know, end users, you know, not liking, um, you know, to comply with something or just an organization not wanting to uh, proceed with something that we're recommending. Um, the beauty here is when we're taking a look at, you know, a, a risk assessment and we're looking at uh, cyber insurance, um, this takes some of that pressure off of us making those recommendations. It allows us to, you know, good cop, bad cop, um, because ultimately, um, you know, it, it's kind of like, um, you know, the child, you know, you know, my son comes to me and says, you know, hey, hey, dad, um, you know, I want to I want to I, I be able to do this. And, I, you know, I give my opinion and, um, you know, and then they don't like it. But then they go to their friend's house and their friend's parent says, oh yeah, that, you know, says the same exact thing. Then they accept it. And it's like, okay, so I, I told you that, but you didn't like what I told you, but now yeah. because you're hearing it from someone else and it's a requirement, it's yeah. accepted. And so that's going to help us drive, um, you know, drive the results that we're looking for um, yeah. in protecting them. It's also going to drive the sales that we want. Right. So I'm I'm a firm believer that you can sell without selling. So sell without selling, it, you know, allows you to get where what you want. So uh, you spoke a couple of things. I wanna I wanna actually talk through what that looks and feels like, right? So employee awareness training. Say we said, okay, this was all red and terrible, right? Um, I could say before my business review. I'm going to add all of these pieces and create a recommendation for the client, right? So I'm going to say this is phishing training. Uh, we're proposing it, whatever cost, recurring cost. I'll just put $1,000 worth of labor costs for the sake of argument, right? But when I build that recommendation, to have it documented, and Larry said this earlier, when we're documenting it, it's showing, it's a different level of it's not just a casual recommendation that I think we need this, right? We're documenting that this is a thing, but then to be able to put recommendations in front of them and show them this is what we expect from you and to be to filter out like, these are the ones we propose that you haven't accepted or these are the ones that you've declined, right? So heaven forbid, if MFA has been declined three times, when you're starting to track, right? People require MFA. You've declined it three times and we're tracking the fact that you've declined it. Now, I know a lot of folks that that's just unacceptable and won't do that for MFA. So that's just an example. But if you have recommendations that you're really prioritizing and you are showing that like we consider this a priority and they're on the hook for having declined, you know, that's that's a very different. They suddenly get that in the risk conversation, you have documented, you've identified for them the risk, it is their risk. Right. And yes. and have that conversation. What is your comfort level? I was on a, um, a live stream with an MSP this morning who was talking about the fact that, you know, if a company is a brand new startup with zero MRR, right? They're not thinking, well, I better pay a couple thousand dollars a month to secure zero MRR, right? But to say, to work with that company and say, okay, as you grow, we need to mature your security posture. But there are some things right. that are baseline right out of the gate. You MFA or you don't work with us, right? Or, or whatever yep. your, your stance is, right? Yeah. But then 
we're going to keep bringing these back to you because as you grow, you need to mature your, your stack, you know, your security posture along with your company. Absolutely. Um, there, there are a couple questions out here. Um, the first one here, uh, we'll go ahead and answer live. Uh, the, the book uh, that you were mentioning, the, the why book, Marnie? Oh, yeah. Yes. The MSP. Do you want me to put a link to it in the chat? Yeah, that'd be great. I can do it. Fortunately, Amazon knows I've searched for it more than once. So uh, I actually, <laughs> I, since since we uh, since they have asked, I would love to mention this about the book. Um, all right, let me find that one. There we go. Um, I'm putting it in the Q and A. So for this particular book, um, half of the proceeds go to a scholarship. So we. Um, we are providing scholarships for CompTIA certifications. So um, awesome. I think that's important to know that half of that goes to, uh, we're not getting rich off of um, QBR handbooks. We are trying to help better the space for sure. All right, that's sorry. Next so you're, you're, not, you're not buying your yacht with that, right? I know, I, I'm <laughs> trying not to buy a yacht at all. As a right. of, I don't <laughs> want a yacht, thank you. That's awesome. Um, and then, uh, Let's see here. How do we approach organizations that are not pro providing cell phones to employees, employees that don't want to use their cell phones? Ooh, um, you know, in in my MSP, um, you know, we don't really see a lot of issues from end users uh, when it comes to this. I think most are, um, you know, most employees are pretty reasonable from a BYOD um, perspective, you know, bringing and using their own device. Um, I will say, you know, I, you know, you do see it from time to time. Um, it, it ultimately is something that the organization has to take into consideration and determine, um, you know, if, if this is, uh, something that they're absolutely against, um, you know, that they have to make some, you know, they have to make some, uh, offerings and some compromises there. And it could be a simple, as uh, given a stipend um, towards their cell phone bill. It could easily resolve it. You know, here's $20 a month towards your cell phone bill uh, that we're gonna pay. And it immediately, you know, squashes that uh, issue that they had. Um, but I think putting it in the employee agreement, so it's not a surprise, right? So yeah. it feels like a bait and switch if you get hired and then they say, oh, I assume you're bringing a cell phone to the table and you're gonna, right? Like yeah. that's not fair. If it's part of the process of we're serious about security, part of that is you will be required to MFA. In to your point, we give you a stipend to support it, right? Absolutely, and I I think too, um, you know, you know, many years ago when you know before the whole unlimited data, unlimited, uh, you know, minutes yeah. and all that, yeah. you know, it was much more of an issue. Um, I think more are. Uh, accepting that it's just part of the, you know, part of the process these days. Um, and uh, Maurice, you're exactly right. You know, you want to convince uh, your, you know, your clients to, you know, buy from you, you know, not necessarily, you know, not selling to them. Absolutely. I love that. Um, I'm answering this. Simon Sinek, start with why. Why in the chat? Sorry, someone said, what book did I refer to? Simon Sinek's. Um, so, Jonathan asks, is the backup category about immutable backup or remote backup? So if you are looking at the offsite backup category that's on the assessment, this is at, so I'm going to, let me see how many more questions. I'll scroll this through this fairly slowly um, and I'll read them out loud. I know sometimes it's hard to read off a smaller, anybody on this on their phone is now just in agony. <laughs> um, does the applicant have formal processes for regularly backing up, archiving and restoring sensitive data and critical systems? Are the applicant's backups physically disconnected, segregated from the network? Are backups encrypted? Does the applicant use MFA to access backup systems? How frequently does the backup solution run? Estimated amount of time it will take to restore essential functions in the event of a widespread malware or ransomware attack within the network. Are backups secured with different access credentials from other administrator credentials? Has the applicant tested the successful restoration and recovery of, C of key server configurations and data from backups in the last six months? And is the applicant able to test the integrity of backups prior to restoration to make sure they're free of the malware? Um, one of the things I'd like to point out here is that, and I bet Larry, you can attest to this, 
you're not going to see all these questions on every liability insurance policy. Not all the insurance companies are mature themselves enough to know to ask these questions. So all insurance carriers are not created equal. Do you want to speak to that? No, you're absolutely correct. You're not going to see all those questions on every single application that you come across. Some of them are going to be as simple as, you know, do you does the organization do weekly backups, daily backups, monthly backups? And that's that's all they'll ask. It just depends on the individual insurer, absolutely. Um, just going through a few other questions here. Um, just see any, uh, did not see any mention about email protection from phishing attacks, which is where a majority of the attacks originate from. Either of you guys want to speak on that? So just uh, email protection from phishing attacks. Interesting. I think there is a, a category of questions around um, that. Let me look. Email yep, filtering, right. spam attack filtering. Yeah. So here are the questions that they're typically asking. I think I can get them all in one screen. <laughs> oh, almost. Um, do they use a filtering tool, list the vendor? Um, do they have a tool designed to prevent phishing or ransomware attacks? Um, is there an email quarantine service, what, a way to detain malicious email, and then applicant have uh, evaluate and confirm sender policy SPF on incoming emails? So they're definitely asking questions about that. Perfect. Yeah, um, yeah. And then uh, is the backup category about immutable backup or remote backup? Yeah, that's the one that I just clicked yeah. off of. Okay. That was that was the offsite backup piece. Um, what's interesting is one of the, I will tell you, if you're looking for sort of around the email conversation, one of the things that a lot of folks, as a matter of fact, it was our most requested um, enhancement request was the ability to share Microsoft Secure Scores because people mm -hmm. wanted the security score with the how much MFA can impact that score for a particular client. So again, just like Dan, you were saying, right? They ask you, but then they go ask their friend's dad. And they're like, oh, right. it must be true. My friend's dad says it, right? The Microsoft Secure Score, again, is not your score. It's the Microsoft Secure Score. So that sometimes helps with that conversation for sure. Let me get back into the assessments. Um, I, I will point out, since folks are asking a lot of questions about this, we have a free 30-day trial to Lifecycle Insights. So if folks are really interested in this assessment, you can sign up for a free trial and download the assessment and it's yours, right? So yeah. we don't, uh, we, we typically we typically make it open access to a lot of things. So if if the assessment alone um, is what you're interested in, you absolutely could sign up just to go grab that assessment. We'd hope to provide you more value than that. But if you're thinking, well, this is the place I need to start, then there's a little life hack for you. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Carmen is asking the question, um, you know, about software using that is, it is Lifecycle Insights, which you can find at lifecycleinsights.io. Um, and, uh, and as Marnie was just mentioning, there is the 30 day trial, which is a, uh, you know, great way to, to, uh, uh, kick the tires and test it out. Um, obviously it is, uh, so much more than just the assessment on the insurance piece. There's a ton of assessments and, and well more than, um, you guys have continued to build and grow this list. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, it. you saw it today. We're like, oh, wait, that's a lot more assessments in there. Yeah. Um, as a matter of fact, the assessment piece of the platform is actually free as long as you have the basic uh, module with for five clients. So you can do assessments on prospects and existing clients for a hundred folks for the $75 a month package. Um, I'm sure some of you are thinking like, that doesn't sound like it makes good business sense. So let me just explain that a little bit. Um, it is because we believe that you will build your business, right? When you do assessments and to have the data in the same place when they're prospects as you have when you're having business reviews with them will help you grow and be able to show what you've done for them, right? You were here, now you're here. Um, I think is like, that is our thinking behind why the assessment piece would make sense to, to let folks use for free. So um, that's something to keep in mind. As a matter of fact, I wanna, I will show you what that looks like to be able to take to, this is kind of the reporting, but I wanna show you the comparison piece so that if you are talking with a client and say, okay, we just ran through your cybersecurity liability insurance questionnaire and you're at a 36%, 
we're going to build recommendations for you to move you to an 84%, right? And we can talk about what happens above and beyond that. Sometimes they need the visual to be able to say how you're going to move the needle. It's so hard. It's just like hurricane insurance where we didn't have any hurricanes. So why did I need insurance, right? If you haven't had a ransomware attack, it's harder to know what that looks or feels like, but to visually be able to say, this is sort of your risk of where you are for, um, you know, cybersecurity or productivity, right? Slowing of networks, et cetera, all of those things. Um, it's good to be able to have a visual. The other piece is, you know, in the rest of this assessment list, there are a lot of questions around the different types of assets that they have, right? So there are questions around hardware, um, and, you know, firewalls, et cetera. And so are you tracking that and do you have eyes on all of their asset inventory? So that's the other piece. We see a lot of folks needing to have conversations around asset inventory, as well as user, all of the user mm -hmm. piece, right? The human firewalls um, to talk about in a business review. Uh, because they're, again, their insurance policies are asking about this and you can use that as the evidence that you need, they need these services. Absolutely. Um, and Norm was asking um, if there's a mixture of results, um, there's only a yes or no <clears throat> answer. Um, oh, yeah. So um, depending on the, so in this assessment, um, most of them are yes or no, right? Because this is what, this is the way cyber insurance carriers are asking them. But certainly we have the ability to say in the middle, right? Um, so you can see on our assessments, you can have at risk needs attention or satisfactory. I'll tell you where a lot of folks use this. If you said my preferred stack, so I'm away from the insurance piece for a minute, but let's just say Meraki is my preferred solution. And my, you know, so we're talking about um, Meraki servers and that's satisfactory. And at risk is something completely unsupported past end of life. And yellow might be, we've got a year left on a contract that we're going to let them use, and then we're going to upgrade them to ours. So that's where we see folks using a yellow needs attention. So it's not um, it's not completely at risk where they're completely in jeopardy, right? They might have an antivirus, but it's not your preferred antivirus, et cetera. That's where we see folks using that middle ground assessment. We certainly have the capability. It's just whether or not you want to score it that way. Awesome. Um... Someone asked if it was a privacy issue. I'm not sure. I think that was related. I think back. that was for the phone, right? People yeah. don't want to put MDM on their phone or don't want to, you know, they don't want to have their phones monitored. So that's for sure. I think, you know, if that's the number one concern that the end users need to really decide, yeah. are they going to take a hard stand and do it up front, right? In your employment agreement, again, you make it clear if you're taking this job, this is what we've agreed to, or they have to take the other stand of them. We're going to provide phones to everyone, right? Like you've got, you got one or the other um, that. I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, it, it's a requirement for um, us to be protected um, for our businesses and our clients. And so, you know, business owners have to, um, you know, make a determination of the approach that they want to take to be able to achieve um, the, the, you know, goals and requirements. Um you know, if it comes down to that they need to provide a phone, um, you know, that might be the case. And, uh, you know, hopefully not across the board, but maybe in some unique and rare situations. Um, but those are those are valid things that a business owner is going to have to make a decision on um, based on, um, you know, really uh, other things in the business that they might be dealing with. Um and there might be other requirements that an you know, employee may or may not uh, want to comply with, um, and they have to make you know some hard decisions in that in those cases. Um, um, just... So I'm answering the question on vulnerability and pen testing. We do don't we're not that type of assessment platform. Ours is more the survey questions that you're asking or that you're you know borrowing from cybersecurity insurance carriers to ask for your partners. Um, 
Mick asked, I'm curious what you do, don't put MFA on. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to answer that for, for what, what the world should be, but I can tell you that what I've heard from cybersecurity liability insurance folks is that the question is, is just moved from, do you have MFA on everything? So there's Correct. an expectation that it is on everything and that you disclose what it is not on. So most important is accuracy um, and honesty on the form. Their expectation is everywhere. Um, Larry, do you see anything different on how to respond to that? Really don't. I think you've covered it right there. I mean, it really is. You just got to key in on the accuracy. You got to be truthful about it. And again, document the heck out of it and that, that you've got this stuff in place. And, you know, insurers, we often drive, as I think Marty said earlier on, we, we drive technology, but at the same time, we lag technology. So many of the carriers out there are simply asking that question, if you have MFA, because they don't understand what else they should be asking. And I think that's exactly what you were saying a little bit earlier. Um. I was asked what we integrate with or if it's standalone. Yeah. We do require an integration. So our, our uh, you're required to have one of these five integrations, uh, ConnectWise Manage, Autotask, Halo, Synchro, or IT Glue. Uh, so that is where, you know, there are lots of pieces that we haven't talked today about today in terms of lifecycle insights, but we do, um, we automate asset lifecycle management reporting user reporting and a budget forecast. So we're pulling companies' contacts and assets from your PSA so we can deliver that information. So that is that is why that's um, you know why we require a primary integration. You know, and um, Maurice was asking uh, a couple of questions. One, he was asking about an anonymous attendee that had asked um, uh, back a little bit ago as far as insurance companies. You I know, think it was the, um, I think it was the phone question. I went back and looked. Okay. All right. Perfect. Um, and then the other one is, you know, would it be better to place a clause in your customer agreement um, about grace, greatly reducing risk uh, of your cyber attacks on all forms? Um, we just recently had a webinar um, in the last couple of weeks with um, an attorney, Bradley Gross, and mm -hmm. um if you would like to uh, go back to everythingmsp.com and click on the videos tab, um, it's a great event that you can learn about um, uh, many of these type of things from his perspective. And so I will uh, just kind of direct that one right back to there. Um, Not an attorney and we right don't play one on TV, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Math uh, teacher is a different question though. Right. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> <laughs> I play one all the time. <laughs> a lot of great questions. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. We will, we will send a replay for sure, Nick. Thank you for joining. Absolutely. So, um, Marty, um, is there more that you'd like to mention? Because I think there were quite a bit more questions in regards to uh, Lifecycle Insights. And I think the trial is probably one of the best ways to uh, get the you know the best feel for uh, the the full capabilities of lifecycle insights. Oh yeah, so would love to would be happy to chat. Um, so lifecycle in uh, you know what? Let me just pull up the pricing page. It just makes it so much easier. We're not shy about it. Um, and this way, I can show you right where the um, right where the free trial is. There's the big click for free trial button. There's the other add VCIO package on the left hand side, which also has a free trial for 30 days. Um, for five or 25 clients. So this is based on number of active clients. I mentioned that if you have the up to five active clients, um, you can do unlimited assessments. That is true. So the five active clients is all about that primary integration piece and all the parts we're integrating, you're automating. Um, you can do assessments on pre-sales and um, your, your existing clients above and beyond that. Um, so above that, just clicking through the pricing. You can see it's just a monthly cost, um, you know, for the number of clients you would expect to do business reviews for. Um, when you become a Lifecycle Insights partner, it's it takes about 20 minutes to plug in API keys and about 40 minutes for us to do warranty lookups for you. So we do warranty lookups to get that asset lifecycle management reporting more accurate. Uh, we integrate with quite a few pieces. So I'll show you um, the integrations for supplemental data down here, you can kind of take a look at what we have along those lines. Um, and then we have 
you know, if you're a DIY kind of IT person, we've got an onboarding checklist. We have weekly onboarding calls. We always offer free one-on-one -on -one support. Um, one thing I'd love to just plug um, is we're starting, we're doing a VCIO bootcamp in October. It is $600 a seat, but if anybody's really aiming to shake out and refine their VCIO process, their QBR process, and want to have somebody, you know, a group of folks really talk about best practices in assessment and how to do QBR presentations. Um, I encourage anybody to reach out to me. I'll put my email in the chat. There you go. Um, if anybody wants to reach out or poke me on LinkedIn, we're always happy to talk. We're always happy to talk QBRs. No. <laughs> Whether you're a life cycler or not. <laughs> Absolutely. And as we're wrapping up here, uh, Larry, if you'd like to throw your um, your email into chat as well, that would be great in case anybody has any further questions for you or would like to learn more. Um, Absolutely. So um, we are coming up to the top of the hour here. We want to be respectful of everybody's time. A lot of great questions today. Um, what we will do is we will be putting out the replay of today's event. Um, take a look for the email within the next 24 hours with that information. And we'll also, we will put the additional contact information into the email uh, for anybody that has questions. Uh, Marty, is any any additional information you want to share with us? Um, Boy, I feel like that's all I got. How about that? You tapped me on. 58 minutes in. That's <laughs> awesome. Well, everybody, thank you very, very much for your time today. Um, we appreciate your attendance. We will get the replay information out to you. With that being said, hope everybody has a great rest of your day. Marty and Larry, thank you very much, as always, for your knowledge. Oh, Absolutely, thanks. Marty. Nice job. Nice job. Killed it. Nice talking there with you. Go. Everybody care, have a guys. great day. Dan, feel Take better, care. buddy. Thank you.